Welcome to the She's Got Gumption podcast. I'm your host, Wendy J. Olson. On this podcast, we share stories, stories of struggle, stories that are messy, stories that don't necessarily have a happy ending, but they do all share one thing, and they all have Jesus. I call these Jesus stories, and on this podcast, we talk about the hard things. These are not neat and tidy and tied up in a bow stories. This is real life. This is raw life. This is your story. Welcome to the She's Got Gumption podcast. Happy New Year. We are in 2019. I don't know about you guys, but I am so excited that the holidays are behind us. I am not looking forward to the next two months of cold weather. My body hates the cold weather and I don't know what to do about it anymore. So I'm going to sit here on my couch cuddled up under a heated blanket and I will see you guys in public back in March when it starts to warm up again. Um, This week on the podcast, I have my friend Bryn Weed. Bryn is somebody that I met, of course, on Instagram. I started following her and we started chatting about what it's like to be a special needs mom. She has a a son with special needs, an older daughter, and then she's also fostering a young uh, little baby boy. Um, We get to talk about that. We get to talk about her journey and just what led her to foster care. And um, we also get to drool a little bit over the fact that she lives in Lake Tahoe, which is easily one of the most beautiful places in the United States. So um, here's my conversation with Bryn. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. All right. Thank you, Bryn, for being on the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Can you give everyone just like the five minute cliff notes of who you are and what you're about and all that jazz? Sure. Um, So I, my name is Bryn and I live in Lake Tahoe, California. Uh, with my husband and then we have two kids one of whom is our biological daughter and then we adopted our almost two-year-old son from foster care and then right now we are actually fostering another little guy who's uh five months old five months old and then we actually just found out we're pregnant so that they got over four on the way and that is so exciting congratulations <laughs> thanks wasn't really planning that 11 month gap but of you know that yeah um so yeah, so honestly, life is kind of crazy right now. I don't do much other than like the whole kid and mom life, um, but it's a pretty great place to call home and I pretty great family to be stuck with. So that's just kind of my life right now is the day-to-day mom routine. Um, I used to do a lot more fun stuff and soon hopefully we'll get back on the agenda, but we do, one of our sons has um, special needs and so right now while he's really young, we're kind of focusing on a lot of therapy with him. So that just takes up a lot of my like day to day life. And then obviously being pregnant, I hate being pregnant. Like I like babies, uh-huh. but the pregnancy sucks. So for the next six months, I'm basically just going to have a little pity party and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> feel sorry for all the things I can't do. But no, normally I just like, um, I don't know, just like taking our kids out. We do a lot of road trips, do a lot of travel. Um, my husband just bought a business this year. So we've kind of be- gotten that whole adventure of becoming business owners and trying to do taxes and paperwork and all that fun stuff. So yeah, life's like full and crazy, but nothing too glamorous. Well, you know, my kids are older, they're 14 and, and six and you still don't do fun things. Even when <laughs> you're still just doing mom things, you know, it's just different mom things. It changes. So yeah. I think you learn I, how to make it fun, right? <laughs> yes, there's fun in those moments because they're only going to be that age for you know a certain amount of time. So we try to enjoy everything as it comes. But um, we were talking about we like to joke with them like tick tick tick. Only twelve more years until everyone's moved out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we're like, when we do that, like we're going to hit our midlife crisis. We're going to you know have naked Thursdays. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> and our our kids are like, stop! That's so gross. <laughs> I feel like it's so good to have a bucket list for like the kid years. Like we have all these things. It's like, okay, I want to do like, we still love traveling and we've always loved travel, but right now it's like, oh, okay, well let's do like kid travel and we'll just embrace that. But I'm, yeah, I'm kind of excited for days when it's like, Hey, it's just Matt and I, and we can just, you know, it's just the two of us and we can travel however we want to. And yeah, I think it's good just to enjoy whatever stage you're at. Cause it honestly is all passing by way too quickly. So I know those days of like just the two of us will come, eventually, but I don't think they're coming anytime soon. So I'll just enjoy where we're at. Well, and you know, you look forward to the times when you can go see a movie that's like rated PG 13 and up, you know, (laughs) (laughs) something with a few inappropriate mild humor jokes, you know, 
but yeah. Oh, it's just going to be fun to like, I can't wait to do like movie daughter dates, like with my daughter, like it's gonna be so much fun. Like I can't, I'm so excited for that. Yeah. That stage. My, my grandma took me to my first rated R movie and it was like a big deal. I think it was like face off or so. it was something like really <laughs> graphic and I was like eight, you know, but I always <laughs> remember that because nobody else's parents, but then my grandma was like, we'll go see a rated R movie. I thought it was Sounds like your grandma's awesome. <laughs> grandma <laughs> goals. <laughs> she was awesome. I love that your husband's name is Matt too. I have several friends. Everyone's husband's name is Matt. So it's like, and aren't they all like the most solid guys ever? Like <laughs> bringing endorsement. If you were like debating who to date. Look for a guy named every Matt I've met. Like, yeah, they're all married to friends of mine and they're all just like pretty solid, pretty like really steady guys. Like that's true. I do. Guys. My sister's brother-in-law's name is Matt. Don't date him. That's the only <laughs> Matt that I know that I'm like, no, he's on the red list. Like, no. Well, one of my favorite pastimes is to tell stories. And before we got on here, we we're just joking around that I, you know, can't tell a short story. You know, our family's known for stories. I love sharing them, but even more so, I just love hearing other people's stories. I love he hearing how people became the versions of themselves that I get to see today. And I know that life is a journey and it's a story in the making, but what's yours? Um, so Jesus has been, without a doubt, the foundation of my story, like from day one. Um, I, I technically, you know, like became a Christian, invited my heart when I was five. And I remember every detail. And honestly, like it's just been, there hasn't been a single like defining moment. It's just been a wonderful relationship with him. And it's just continued to grow every single year. Um, I think one of the biggest things with our, with my relationship with God is that uh, three or four years ago, I started, I made like all these New Year's goals and resolutions. And one of them was to read through the Bible in a year. And the other is, was to read one nonfiction book per month. And just the way that God spoke, like the books that I was reading, reading his word, like realizing what a difference there is between the American Christianese that we all live and think mm. is normal. And like the distance between that and the actual Jewish carpenter who lived 2000 years ago and who was amazing. Like just, it opened my eyes so much to the lifestyles and choices we were making, how much we just think is normal and don't really question things and what it really means to live for God and just pour out your life as a living sacrifice, as a living prayer, as worship to him. And that's honestly been the most changing thing in our life and how Matt and I do life. And that's led us onto the journey of foster care, of adoption, of Oh my gosh, everything, you know, from how we spend our time, the, where our finances go, um, how we treat other people, how we see opportunities and just being, it's like having your eyes constantly wide open to like, how can I love someone else? How can I serve someone else in this? And not to say that we do it perfectly at all. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's so wonderful because we don't do it perfectly, which means that his grace is just enough to cover everything. Like I know I realize more and more like every year, even though everyone's like, Oh, you're doing all these great things. Or like, Oh my goodness, look at all, you know, like you do all this good stuff. It's like, no, like I, the more, the older I get, the more I realize how wide of a gap there is. Like I can never do anything good without my own sin tainting it. It affects everything. And everything I do is somehow rooted in selfishness. And the fact that God's grace is just that much undeserved by anything I've done makes it that much more special and beautiful and amazing. Um, so yeah, it's just been a really great story and there's been ups and downs, but I'm just so grateful for where God has led me. And even now he's used those periods of down or the hard stuff. He's like used it for his glory or given me a better appreciation for how to love people, how to empathize with people, um, realizing that all of us are broken and not being judgmental. Um, yeah, it's just, it's been, it's been an interesting ride, but a good one. I love that you brought that up too, because sometimes as Americans, we think Christianity was like an American invention. Like we invented it in 1776 right. when we invented it. No, 1950s, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's like, uh, or, or the things that you learned growing up. Now you became a Christian at a very young age. So did you grow up in church then? Like, was that kind of your... I did. Um, yeah. So I grew up going to church and honestly, my extended family is, uh, was very... Just and let my grandparents get a lot of credit for raising us um, just with a really strong faith and a really solid foundation of scriptures and challenging and thinking and just that good foundation to set you forward in life. Um, and my parents, uh, 
they made a bunch of crazy decisions and they were not, I, my own like personal family. It's one of those things where like you, when you grow up in a situation, it, you think it's normal. Like kids yeah. think whatever their reality is, is normal. Right. And then when you become an adult, you can kind of realize like, wow, that was really toxic. That was really yeah. caustic. Mm -hmm. That was actually not normal. There's no way now as a parent that I would do those things to my own kid. Um, and so they, um, made just continually like bad choices, um, very bad marriage. And so we like growing up, it was just kind of our faith got, I was going to say like our whole family got shaken a lot. And that's one of those things where like there, but for the grace of God go, I like, I don't know how or why God just swooped in and protected me, but he did. And just kind of like he would every time my feet would start to go on down one path, it's like he would pick me up and put me on the right one. And I had all the right intentions. I loved him like crazy, but I did not have a lot of good things going around me. So not a lot of great examples, not a lot of good. good guy. Um, yes, exactly. Like going on. And he just provided people in my life that weren't a part of my family to pour into me. He um, provided my grandparents who were amazing people and very steady and loved me. And he just kind of provide a way. And then when my husband and I got married, it was a really good opportunity for us to come together. And he kind of comes from his own brand of crazy too. <laughs> Who doesn't? And so well, we just, that, so <laughs> right. <laughs> so steadiness came because he was surrounded by some chaos too. <laughs> so we, um, and we just like, it was a really good opportunity for us to be like, okay, we can, you know, you can either look at the decisions and the choices other people made and you can make the same ones because that's all you've seen or you can learn from their mistakes. And so we've just tried our hardest to learn what not to do and do the opposite. And like, this is how our family is going to work. We're going to have good communication. You know, we're going to be open. We're going to be honest. God is going to be first. There's no secrets. There's no hiding. Um, you know, just like putting those good boundaries in place, being on the same team from day one, um, putting those good habits, having God first. And yeah, so just, and it gave me, and it's, it's great now to see like with my own foster kids, um, you know, I, I never want someone to hear stories about my dad and associate me with those choices or those decisions or that lifestyle. And so any kid that comes to our house, I never see my son or my foster son as an extension of their parents. They're always their own people. And yeah, we come from two broken families, but like there, but for the grace of God, I didn't end up in foster care. And you know, when I hear about stories about where their parents made and the choices they made, they're very similar to some of the decisions my own parents made and just realizing that there's just a lot of brokenness and that no one can do it without Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus as like the foundation of everything you do, then it's really easy to make those choices. I, um, I made a really good friend when we lived in, um, in Brenham and we've lost touch in the last um, year, year or so now, but, uh, she similar path, the difference is she went to prison for her mistakes and I didn't. And I was like, but we're so closely aligned. We're the exact same person. So like, whether you, you know, did have your kids taken away for foster care, or you, you know, um, or not, you're still each just one decision away, even as you're, walking with Jesus, you're still just one bad decision away from going the complete opposite direction. I mean, I can sit here and my mind can wander and, you know, I can slip into bad habits just as easily as I can, you know, say, no, I'm not going to do that today. You know, mm -hmm. and it's the, the kids that you're, you're seeing, I, I love that you have so much empathy for them because you totally understand where they're coming from and you know how to separate the two, um, from your past experience. Yeah. I think that's really beautiful. I think that that is something that I can tell is like one of your callings. Do you feel, did you feel like that going into foster care or were you just like, Hey, this looks like fun. Let's try this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it's really interesting talking to a lot of people who start foster care. I don't think anyone enters foster care. Like I said before, like it's impossible as a human to do anything from selfless motives. Right. Yes. So, like I would love yes. to say that like, Matt and I are just the best people and we started this completely selfless. Like we were actually pretty selfish, I think. Um, I mean, we started it. So we used to live in San Diego and we lived in like, we we're, you know, newly married, had a little kiddo, totally broke, lived in an RV um, at a travel trailer park for like a year and a half. We paid off all of our student loans and did the whole Dave Ramsey thing. 
So we lived Such in like, a smart idea. I totally wish I would have done that when I was younger. But. Oh, it was great. Like it's yeah. Highly recommend ringing endorsement, do financial peace if you haven't like it's amazing. But yeah, so I, we lived in like the ghetto and so we always, there were always homeless people around. And so we'd always like take them out to eat or give them rides somewhere, take them to target to go get some shoes or something like that. And so we just tried to talk to them and just be like, Hey, so you know, kind of like you're doing here, what's your story? How'd you get here? And nine times out of 10, they were all like, well, I was in foster care and I just yeah. aged out. And it was so heartbreaking hearing that. And so I was reading Love Does like a year and a half later. Mm, when so to, good. Oh, love that. Oh my gosh. Bob Goff, all the goals. I know. Um, so I was reading that book and he talked about like, if you know, you can't solve homelessness, but if everyone fed the person right in front of them, there would be no more problem. Mm. And so I was thinking about it and I was like, well, if you're really trying to solve homelessness, like foster care and kids not getting adopted from foster care seems to be a big part of the equation. Yeah. So what can I, I'm like, okay, well I can't feed the whole world, but I like being, I love being a mom yeah. and we have a great family so we could adopt a kid. So that's kind of where it came from. Also came from like, oh yeah, I love being a mom. Hey, being pregnant. Cool. Okay. Like yeah. I'm going to adopt. That's fine. So like, it definitely wasn't purely selfless motives at all, but it is crazy to see how like through the process, like how God changed her. And I've talked to so many of my friends and the exact same thing happened where like they started it from like, oh, well, I can't have kids and it's an affordable way to adopt or, you know, just similar kind of stuff where it's all about them. And it's crazy how God takes like our most selfish like desires and all of a sudden like completely changes your heart through it when you see that like your heart slowly changes from being about you to about being about someone else. Mm -hmm. So I can now say like it's more about the kids that are involved. It's less, it's become much less about Matt and I and our family. And now it's, these are our kids. Our family looks like what, whoever comes through our door and our priorities have changed, but we definitely didn't start that way. And again, God gets the credit for changing our heart, but I think that's pretty universal. And also in good encouragement for like, you don't have to be a saint. God will change your heart. You can give him 1% effort and it's amazing how he will never fail to come alongside and completely just change everything about your heart, your desires, your intentions, and use it for good. Were you able to establish a relationship with any of the biological parents through foster care at all? Yeah, so we weren't. Um, our boys' cases are they're kind of they're, they're heartbreakingly sad. And at first, I kind of felt like a failure because, yeah, my so my son Cohen is two, um, and then are um five yeah and then the other one is five months old um and they're actually half brothers and Aww. we're going to be adopting the five month old sometime next year so that's super exciting that is so, exciting yeah um so they are kind of related in their cases as far as there's a lot of the same people involved um but and there's such a push in foster care to like be supportive of bio parents mm -hmm. and there's a lot of good reasons for that and a lot of cases where that does make sense but it kind of made me feel ostracized at first because our case is not like that. Um, there's a lot of domestic violence, a lot of drug. Both of our sons were actually just abandoned in the hospital and wow. there's never been any visits, no parents ever interested. Um, anytime potential parents were contacted, they were always like, that's not my kid. Get out of here. You can't test my DNA. You know, very, very much not wow. interested in being involved. So um, in some ways though, that's made that, easier because there's just a clean break right. and our boys just know our home we're mom and dad and as they get older we can kind of walk down that road together and we have information on the bio parents and kind of like their histories and so obviously as the boys get older we can kind of share appropriate information with that um the sat one of the saddest things is there were um some biological relatives who were kind of involved at one point but when they found out our son had special needs, they had no interest in having any relationship whatsoever, which was just really heartbreaking. But I'm also glad that we found that out now so that, yeah. you know, my son isn't like nine years old and all of a sudden being rejected. Type yeah. thing. But again, another kind of really sucky situation that we're going to have to walk through with him later. And so, yeah, right now I'm just enjoying the toddler years where it's like, <laughs> mommy, daddy, and that's all that's going on. But I'm definitely like preparing myself and just kind of trying to like, glean words of wisdom from other adoptive parents from other similar situations, just so that when those questions do start coming up, we can, you know, they're their own 
they're their own boys. They're going to be their own men. And my husband, and I really just want to like set them up to do well in life and just support them as much as possible. And just, you know, kind of walk through whatever they want to walk through as they get older. Can you talk a little bit about your son's special needs? How long ago was he diagnosed? Yeah. So my son has spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy and he also has PVL, which is I'm not even going to try to say it in English, prevent <laughs> something like preventricular leukomalacia, um, which wow. basically means like a bunch of brain bleeds and stuff like that. And he has some um, excess fluid in his brain and underdeveloped front. His brain's just kind of a mess, all thanks to drugs. Oh. So, um, so he was, this was all damage done at like birth or yeah, in, in, in utero, kind of basically. Yeah. Um, but he is amazing, just incredible champion. The things that he's doing. Every time we see his neurologist and she'll look at like a recent MRI, she's like, there's no way he should be doing what he's doing. So he's mm -hmm. just, so, which also breaks my heart because I look at both of them and they're so smart and so funny and like just have the cutest personalities. And it's like, you know, from having my own biological kids, like I know how much of my daughter comes from my husband and I, and so yeah. I'm like, man, like your parents, like they must be just some of the smartest people like around, like funny and smart and engaging like and champions and just wow drugs really do that much damage to a person like they really alter um people that much because I know that these boys came from somewhere and they're amazing like just some of the smartest little kid like our son Cohen he, he's just a champion so he got diagnosed when he was six months old um, and for the first six months, like he didn't do anything except scream, stare at the ceiling, no eye contact, wow. no milestones, like nothing. And now he's almost two and he's just started crawling on all fours. He can say about 15 words. Wow. He laughs, like loves to play with other kids, teases his sister nonstop. Of course. <laughs> Is it like a total normal two-year-old who just happens to roll around on the floor more than most kids. But just, I mean, for what his spastic quad CP is a pretty severe diagnosis. That means like all of your limbs have been affected by cerebral palsy mm -hmm. and he, you know, can do all the fine motor skills. He can draw, he can play with trains, he can pick up, to, you know, just wow. so many things that so many kids with his diagnosis will never be able to do or take years to do. So he's just super smart little champion. So proud of that guy. Did you, um, have you had him from birth as well? Yep. Yeah. So both of them were just, um, kind of, he was abandoned in the NICU. So he was there for like five weeks and we got the call when he was a week old. So we spent about four weeks just driving back and forth to the NICU and trying to hold him and bond with him as much as possible. And then our other foster son came home, um, yeah, like two days after he was born. So, so you've picked the names for both the boys. Yeah, we did. Uh, what yes. Is, what What does Cohen mean for you guys? So Cohen means, shoot, I'm going to butcher it now. I'm pretty sure it means brave. Oh. <laughs> I remember there was meaning behind what we have. I think it means brave or strong. And then his middle name, Uzziah, um, is from, that was the Sunday that we went to go see him for the first time. The sermon was on King Uzziah and just the importance of finishing strong. King Uzziah lived in the Old Testament and he was this like amazing man of faith his whole life. And unfortunately, totally screwed up at the end of his life. Yeah. And, but it's just like that, a good reminder to just keep fighting the faith, like keep running strong. You have to finish to the end. And we just wanted to kind of bless this little boy with like just a really strong name that he could go forward and fight. And then I can't share our other son's name yet. Right. Um, similar kind of meanings and similar kind of names for him as well. I'm reading this book. Are you familiar with the Allender Center in Seattle? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, I'm totally going to endorse them because I only found out <laughs> about them like maybe a week ago, but I'm obsessed. Okay. Um, he talks Tell me about everything. <laughs> in his book called, uh, to be told by Dan Allender. He talks about how our family of origin gives us a name and our life plays out according to this name. And so if they choose, you know, haphazardly, like Allison or Jennifer, I don't know what those mean, but like, just, <laughs> Oh, I just like this name, you know, and don't put a lot of thought into it. That can really damage, um, what they're, what they're called, but how God always brings it around and eventually we'll all get new names. So I think Cohen is so perfectly intentional in that he is brave and that you keep calling him your champion, which I love. Um, and that he's, 
Like he knows that, you know, like every time you call his name, you're not just calling him um, what his name is, but you're calling him to be brave and you're speaking that over him. Oh, I, I love that. It's like, yeah, it's like you're speaking light, like words of life over someone's life, like over and over again. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that. When my daughter was little, um, she, in the toddler years, probably around the same age Cohen was, she was awful. She was horrible. And I used to call her my ferocious beast because she just, she was just ferocious. Like she just, I, I mean, she's seven years younger than her brother, but she always is just, she was like picking on him and everything. And she just was a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. And then one day I was like, I'm just going to tell her nice things and positive things all day long and see if that helps change her behavior. And it did. And I was like, <laughs> Once I started telling her, you're such a good girl and you're always so sweet and so kind and you're so loving and then just speaking more positive things over, she quit being as. Oh yeah. They have whole like, so they make you take all these parenting classes every year as part of foster training and stuff um, to stay certified. And they have whole classes on like the power of words and positivity in people's yeah. life. And it actually makes sense. Like they give an example of like, just someone going throughout their day, like a kid and how many times they get barked at, like, go faster, do this. Why are you so slow? Why are you figuring this? How come you didn't do this again? And just like had someone stand up and had all of us say those things at them for like five minutes. And then the person felt like crap, right? Like they're like, this is terrible. And then, so instead going through and finding like all the little things to praise. And obviously sometimes like you need to land on your kids. Like sometimes yeah. shape up dude. But, um, but no, it's so important to like, validate them and those little moments, you know, and catch them. Like I, or like, I remember one time with my daughter, it was like kind of the same thing where she was just being crazy, you know, just making terrible choices. You're like, come on, dude. And so I sat down and I was like, Jameson, like, okay, let's talk what you did wrong. You made bad choices. But he, and I, but I wrapped it up with like, I know you, I know you're a good kid. Mm. I see your heart. You have a good heart. You are a good person. I love you. You know, I'm just saying those things. And her face just like melted. And I will never remember that, forget that moment because it's just like, oh my goodness. Like I'm, she needs those. She needs yeah. those words of encouragement. And especially for us as parents, our words have so much meaning and you're, you know, pouring into this life. And like, those are becoming the words they're saying to themselves. And yeah, anyway, there's a lot of psychology behind it too, but no, it's so important to like speak those words of life um, into our kids. It's hard to remember all the time, but when I was going into college, I, me and my best friend were going in together and we had to do orientation. It was something or whatever. And I was supposed to go to a different class and she went to this other class and I was like, well, I want to go to her class. Like, how do I get to go into her class? And it was like the, the, um, the school of social study or whatever it was like social sciences. And I was like, Hmm, I like psychology. Okay. I'll write that down my, as my major. And I went <laughs> in the class with her. <laughs> so for two years I took psychology classes cause they were interesting. And I was like, hmm, I'm, I'm here. I might as well do something. Right. You know? And so I'm very interested in all of that stuff. Like you talk about the brain and you talk about, you know, like anything that has to do with like the underlying little things that you don't realize the manipulation that people can use to like. Oh, right. And it's so crazy. Like crazy. the overlap between, I mean, nurture versus nature, um, human, like the emotions and feelings and decisions versus like what actually scientifically is going on in the brain. Like, you know what I mean? There's just so much like it's science, it's psychology, it's human, it's history, it's personality, like it's all of it connected together. Um, with Cohen, with obviously with his interesting brain, um, I've, I've had to do quite a bit of, when you become like a special needs parent, you basically have to become an advocate. Otherwise, yes. like no one is sitting there feeding you information at all. Nope. So I was like, all right, it's research time. So I've spent a lot of the past year researching neuroscience, brain development, you know, just all the, all that stuff and everything. And it's crazy how much like, I feel like there's a really growing awareness of how much the brain plays a part of what goes on as humans. And, you know, I look at, um, or they're, they're doing a lot of studies between, you know, okay, we have all these mental disorders, but like, what does that actually look like in the brain? Or all of a sudden this kid starts having all these issues at school and becoming really aggressive. Everyone wants to prescribe medication. Well, his uncle happened to be a brain surgeon. So he's like, Hey, let me do an MRI on the kid. So he did. And boom, there's like some missing connection that was going on or like some tumor in his brain 
fixes it, boom, the kid's totally normal. Like you didn't need medication, you know? And so just all that kind of awareness of how that all connects and the psychology or, you know, thinking about, um, you know, our son's parents and kind of the, the diagnosis they've been given, um, the stuff a lot of my family members struggled with and how a lot of that is all brain related. It's just really interesting. Like it's interesting how that psychology, our emotions, what we choose also like is in that chemical kind of where, I mean, I, I know nothing about science. I'm terrible at science <laughs> and math, but, um, but it's just really fascinating. Even for like an English nerd over here, like it's really interesting how all of that plays together. And like, I don't, I think there should be more of like that kind of liberal education as far as like, let's study all of this rather than, oh, I'm just a brain surgeon. I'm just a psychologist. I'm like, dude, let's put this together because yeah. it's, it's all like interconnected. And the cool thing is I think a lot more people are starting to do that. And there is this growing awareness, but yeah, it's really fascinating how all that plays together. Well, you would think that they would all benefit from like a cooperative office of like a one-stop shop, you know, kind of right. like when you go to buy your house, like there's one place where you like get the mortgage and you get the insurance and you know, you sign your paperwork and everything. Like how come no one's ever thought of like, Hey, all of us really smart people should all be in a room together and talk to each other and <laughs> like help our patients. Like, is that so hard for you genius people who, you know, spend thousands of dollars in your brains? Like that would just sounds like you have a new business idea, Wendy. Think you should go for it. <laughs> I'm going to market that trademark Wendy Olson. <laughs> uh, so did you grow up in California? Like, how did you get to Lake Tahoe? Because one, I have never been to Lake Tahoe, but I've always wanted to go because of the lake. I mean, I I mean, I would put a ringing endorsement. I like to tell people I'm from California. If I'm being completely honest, I grew up in the Midwest (laughs) and you can probably hear it in my accent. I did hear a little, okay. So because my husband is from Minnesota and so Minnesota, yep. I'm right across the border there in Wisconsin. So, okay. (laughs) You know what? I've worked very hard to hide that though. And I've been told that it's working quite well. So (laughs) it does come through once in a while. Honestly, your accent is like bringing it out. You're from Texas, right? I'm not. No, I'm from New York. Something about like, but see, like making me like, I'm like, day, I don't know if it's you're talking faster or like what's going on, but I'm like, man, something is like bringing out the Midwest. This sucks. <laughs> no. So when we, I was nine, boy, which is, means I've lived in Texas for almost 30 years now. Like for the first year that we were down here, um, the kids made fun of me because I had like a really thick Long Island girl neck accent, you know, (laughs) and I got sick of them talking, like telling me that I sounded funny or whatever. So I got rid of it. (laughs) (laughs) I retrained my voice to do that. Now I can totally pull off like a, Hey girl, you know, Texas accent too. Like if you need to, cause I've been here for 30 years, but right. Um, like if you're there long enough, you know how to pull it out. It's yeah. It's, and it's funny. Cause like people be like, Oh, I can hear it. And it's like, yeah, but if you talk to someone who actually lives in the Midwest, like that's the real accent. We have a very filtered real. version of it. Um, so yeah, when we first moved to we when we first moved to San Diego um, in California, and yeah, for the like first couple months, people were like, "What are you even saying?" Yeah, I had them like I worked at a restaurant, so I had all my coworkers tell me like, "Okay, what am I supposed to say instead?" Or like, "I'm still what's the one I can't hear? bag." Okay, it's supposed to be like bag. Bag. Bag or some bag. Thank you. I'm trying to get, <laughs> trying to get that one right. And it's the one stumbling block where like, I'll be talking and all of a sudden if I say bag, they're like, wait, what? Like, Come again. Where are you from? Like, Every, that? Everybody will always tell me as soon as I get like really angry about something and I start like, just I'll talk really fast, but then my New York accent will come out or if I'm around my family. <laughs> Like, right? Oh, family's the worst <laughs> that way. They always drag up the act. Like you, you just revert back to it. Yep. That's Matt. When he goes home to his family too, I'm like, what did you just say? again? <laughs> well, he still pronounces things like instead of Italian, he says Italian. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh like, yeah. The vowels, like, man. The Midwest cannot get over the vowels. <laughs> no. <laughs> All about I'm like, I'm so glad I taught our daughter to read because otherwise she'd be like, eh, eh. <laughs> Well, we asked Jameson to say, that's our daughter. We're like, Jameson, say bag or whatever, however it's supposed to say. And she said it the right way. Like the California, we're like, sweet, good. Okay. Our, our kids are cooler than we are. Like, that's fine. Like our job, our hand, we can wash our hands. Job all done. Our and kids pronounce it correctly. It's so funny. Cause our daughter, she's six and she will 
say things and sometimes have a Minnesota accent, like probably <laughs> from hanging out with her dad too much. And then sometimes when she says things, I'm like, she sounds like a New Yorker too. Like, you know, like right. when she's, well, she always asks, why is Aunt Debbie my, you know, my aunt, why, why she talk funny? I'm like, <laughs> that's how we all talk before I got rid of that. You know, she right. can still keep it because she lives in Florida. That's where all New Yorkers go after a certain age is Florida. But, but yeah, you can't have that here. Let no. me funny him. Dead in the water. You got to blend in. It's Darwinism, <laughs> survival of the fittest. <laughs> it is. If you have a funny accent, you're totally sticking out. Yeah, oh. yeah, exactly. So no, we actually, so we ended up in California. Um, my husband and I got married like right out of college and two seconds later we had Jameson. So we were, um, my husband, he did an awesome job in college. Like he graduated multiple job offers. So we took one, but it was in the landscape industry. And obviously in a place like Wisconsin, where it's like 80 below for seven months out of the yeah. year, um, yeah. landscape companies mostly closed down. So we had this newborn girl, like a ton of student loans. And a company that we knew was shutting down in a couple months. And I was like, screw it. We need to do something about this. Yeah. So I just started sending out resumes anywhere warm. And <laughs> he got a job offer in San Francisco and one in San Diego. And then the one in San Diego just sounded like a better fit. So we didn't have enough money to put down like a down payment on an apartment in San Diego because we already had an apartment in Wisconsin. So we decided to buy the RV and we like moved whatever we wanted to keep in there. We chucked the rest of it away and started a road trip on New Year's Eve and <laughs> took us about a week. We broke down like seven times on the way there. <laughs> Had Oh my like, gosh. Bash, like ended up one time like stranded on top of a mountain in Arizona. It was like freezing. We had no hookups. So we like put Jameson in the middle of us and like put all the blankets on top of her, you know, or, like breathing in where it's like, you're trying not to suffocate your child, but also yeah. keep warm at the same time. Um, and he was pulling it, he was pulling the trailer with like his busted down truck from high school. I was driving our beat up, you know, newlywed broke, um, car with our six month old in the back. And we made it the last night. Like, so we had a moving stipend waiting for us in San Diego and we maxed out like every credit, you know, all the one credit card that we had like, yeah. maxed it out and had $30 left in our bank account. And so we didn't have enough money to stop for the night. And we were so tired. Like we were almost falling asleep at the wheel, but like, we have to keep going. Cause if we break down one more time, we're screwed. Like we don't have yeah. any, and we didn't have like backup or any, you know, like there's no, there's, it's just us. Like there's no reserves yeah. here. So, um, we made it that last night, pulled into San Diego. He went straight to work the next morning to get that moving stipend and checked it in the bank. And then, yeah, it's just been, um, that was a, a really good way to, uh, start marriage <laughs> because we got um a, like wonderful some wonderful stories out of it but also like it's really fun now to look back seven years later and just remember those days of like oh my goodness remember when we literally had seven dollars left to our name yeah. we couldn't even afford to pull over or oh man remember that time we broke down and you know just or where we've come from and just kind of being able to grow together and I don't know and also not take yourself too seriously it's like dude you know, when people pretend like, oh, our whole, you know, everything's picture perfect. It's like, dude, just have fun with it. like life is too short to take yourself seriously. You know, we've had a good time and a good adventure of it. And God has definitely provided and blessed us long. We are no longer in that position, which is good. Um, quite the opposite, but it's been a good ride and it's good to remember where you come from. It is. And it's also good to have those stories that you can pull out at the dinner table where you're like, you better eat all your dinner because there was a time me and your mother right. didn't even have two cents to buy something off the dollar menu at McDonald's. Dollar exactly. menu was a treat. Okay. So you eat all that food. Forget about the starving kids in Africa. We were starving. You're lucky to have food on your plate. You're welcome. Well, it's so funny not like doing the little newborn stuff now, because I remember with Jameson just wanting more than anything. Like I was so sick of hand-me-downs. And all I want to do is like go buy the new baby stuff, yeah, you know, just like, dude, yeah. no, like no one wants hand-me-downs. Just remembering like, but you know, you just make do with what you've got. And it's so much fun now. Like I probably go overboard, but I'm like, I'll go to Target and just be like, I can get it. You know what I mean? Like, right. it's my kids. Like what toys do you want? You know, like I'm trying to not be that parent, but it's so much fun because it's like, I always wanted to do that for them and I never got to. And so it's really fun now to just be like, here's a toy. You get a toy. You, everyone gets a toy. <laughs> <laughs> you're all of your baby clothes, even though you're going to grow out of them in two seconds, you know, just 
I don't but know. It, it's it's you're fun right. to spoil your kids. <laughs> anytime we, we were so broke when Jalen was little and anytime someone gave me $20, I would go and buy him like a toy or a new book or a new shirt or something. You know, I was walking through Walmart, like just the other day. And I was like, do you remember when Walmart was like the place to go? Cause <laughs> you could buy something there. You were like, it was a rare treat, you know, now like we're all bougie and we go to target instead, but <laughs> Back when Walmart was the tree. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Like when, when Walmart even seemed lofty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when Goodwill was like the go-to. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things where like, it just gives you a good appreciation. Um, and it's, it's also too, like, it's just one of those things where like, it gives you a good, you know, just like being a parent, it makes you realize how much God loves us. Cause like, okay, if I, in all my sinfulness, love going to whatever store and just buying my kids new clothes that they don't really, you know, like that kind of stuff, just like lavishing them with those things. Like that's like a infinite, you know, tiny percentile of how God feels about us, you know, just how, which makes so much sense. Cause I look at everything he's given us and blessed us with. It's like, we don't deserve any of this. We haven't done anything to deserve this. And you know what? It can all be gone in a second. And that's okay too. Like, cause God is the only thing that matters. Like it's a good lesson to learn that's like, it's easy come, it's easy go. And, you know, Matt and I are still Matt and I, no matter what kind of house or RV or bank account it looks like, or what store we shot, like whatever, there's so much more important things in life. And like, it's more about what you do with what you've been given at the moment rather than like, oh, I've made it. Cause that's the goal. Yeah. Like, yeah. who cares, dude? Like, it's just a store. It's just money. Like, it's just a good lesson to learn to not cling to it because yeah. it really is so arbitrary. You know, the cool thing now is to sell your house and move into an RV. So really, you know. <laughs> but I was like, dang, we were way ahead of the curve. You were. You invented When we did it, everyone was like, what pot smoking community yeah. are you looking up with? Like you were going to join this house. You're moving to where? California? Like what? They were so concerned. Like I'm You're joining sure. a cult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they thought everything was like, what is going on? And now everyone's like, ooh, live tiny. We are. I'm like, I really should have joined Instagram like six years ago when we did that. Like, dang, I could have we been so cool. Ahead. Right. Like we had it. Although well, yeah, RV wasn't like totally pimped out, but I could have made it pimped out. Like I would have done it. I always like one, like who started that? Was it breaking bad with the old Winnebago? Like were people <laughs> into that? And they were like, that looks cool. It's like a meth RV. Is that like what broke out the trend or is it just the tiny living? I thing? think, I know. I think it's more of like a social. I think people are seriously just again, questioning that whole American dream versus like, cause a lot, what's really cool is like, so I follow a bunch of the tiny living community, obviously, yeah. cause I feel like every few months just, we own an RV now. And I like literally I'm always like, let's just move back. It's fine. Like, I'm just, I have incurable wanderlust and always just want to be moving on the road constantly. That is me. That is yeah, me. Yeah, I, love, exactly. I love it. And so I'm always like following all these people who do it and just kind of like enjoying the spirit and camaraderie and being like, Oh, we did that too. And like, I think it's really cool because a lot of them are Christian and I think a lot of them are just realizing that like, oh my goodness, this prosperity gospel and Jesus suburbia culture, like yeah. that's not who Jesus is. That's not yeah, who God is. And things that like Matt and I, the reason why we have the big house and the minivan, all that stuff is honestly because of the whole foster care and just where we're at right now with that process and kind of the fact that we actually, so this summer we thought we were done doing foster care and we thought we were just going to have two kids. And we were just kind of like over it after all of Cohen's stuff and just needed a break. And so we actually bought the RV this summer and moved into it temporarily, like rented out our house. And then a month later, we got a call about our other son. So we're like, whoops, never mind. Like I had to move back into the house and change everything again. Um, but it was just like, it was so great. Like we just, I think people are more refreshed by what's real, you know, and mm. just less caught up with kind of like, why is everyone spending so much time chasing this stuff that doesn't matter? Like, that's not the things that matter. What matters is your dreams, your desire, what God has made you to do, yeah. being of service, you, you know, experiences over things, like all these things that honestly, they're in the Bible. Like, this is nothing new under the sun, but I, I really think there's this really cool movement where people are discovering it for themselves and actually have, reading the Bible, like yes, <laughs> the Bible. And like, we're in, um, an economy and culture now where like people have the flexibility to do it. It's not so like yeah. fear-based because like, Oh, there's no jobs. Oh, there's no money. Panic. Hold on to everything you have. It's like, everyone's doing really well right now. So there's kind of that like release of like, Oh, I don't have to be so stingy. I don't have to hold on to this. Like I can actually let go. And then when they do, they realize like, Oh, I actually didn't need that stuff anyway. 
Um, I don't know. There's a lot in there, but yeah, I'm, I just, it's really cool. I love that you just kind of talk about life as an adventure. I was just thinking about that this morning, like following Jesus is supposed to be fun. Um, if it's not, you're doing it wrong. You know what I mean? It's an adventure. Like you yeah. moved out to your RV and a few months later you moved back because that's what God called you to do. Otherwise you wouldn't have your third son, you know, um, third child, but it's, it's just always being open to like the ebbing and the flowing of everything, you know, and choosing to be on that adventure with him because it's never going to be boring. You know, it's oh not goodness. meant to be. And his plans are so much better than your, and I just, I remember that verse, you know, it says, um, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I remember reading that and I wanted so badly for that to mean like, oh sweet, everything I want, all these things, right? Like yeah. if I take delight in God, like I get all the things and I was just thinking, I'm like, and I did, like, I read that verse and I just wanted to like, you know, back in college and I was like, I just want to do what God wants me to do. I want to take delight. I want to love him. And the crazy thing is now is like, I do take delight in the Lord and he has given me all the desires of my heart because my desires have changed. Like yes. if you take delight in the Lord, your desires become God in his presence and not the things and not the situations. And so it's one of those things where like following God or Jesus, like, yeah, it shouldn't be drudgery. It should be joyful, even in the hard stuff. You know, there's a yeah, lot of, in the suffering. Um, yeah, there's a lot of hard stuff that, you know, that we go through with our boys and um, the situations they've come from or um, family members making, extended family members making terrible decisions or, you know, just friends going through hard things and you're trying to be there with them. And I mean, it's life, right? Like we're all going through that and um, together. And yet just realizing that like, man, God, like that's, those are the things that matter. God matters. And even in the hard times, you can still have that joy that's from him. Like the joy of the Lord is my strength. Like it doesn't move. Even if your circumstances change, even though we've been, this year has been so crazy and so much turnover. Like we sold a house, moved, bought a business, quit a job, you know, just all this stuff. And like, it definitely didn't always look like roses this year. Like it definitely, there were definitely points where like it was stressful or there was reason to stress. And yet even in the midst of that, like you can still have fun because God's in control and you have that joy and just knowing that like God always provides, even if that provision looks like you getting up off your butt and working really hard, yeah. like he's, he always provides, everything will be provided for. It just sometimes takes you, it's just not handed to you. If that makes sense. That does make sense. It makes perfect sense. I love that. You're full of wisdom, Brent. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can keep, keep talking and say all the things. <laughs> you're very pretty and you're also a good mom. No. <laughs> all the things that women want to hear. I want to hear that I'm a good mom. I want to hear that I'm pretty and that I'm smart too. There we okay. go. Next there time. we go. All right. Yep. I'm coming back on. Let's do podcasts okay. more often. <laughs> <an hour. laughs> well, I have several questions that I'm asking everyone. And um, I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> What are some of the lessons that you've learned along the way that are something you're now working on, um, either changing or teaching your children, this whole new generation that you're responsible for raising? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think some of it, at least for me personally right now, and again, the stage that we're in with like the little kids stage, I think it's kind of things that we talked about, um, which is more like Matt and I setting up our family and how we want to raise our kids and the opportunities we want to give them again, looking at the mistakes other people have made and trying to learn from that and kind of what not to do. And so just, you know, I am not saying that we don't make our own mistakes as well, but um, really just trying to um, provide like that biblical foundation and that love, but encouraging our kids to just, just not have these set boxes as far as like what God calls you to, or like, you know what I mean? Like that Americana, this is the way God works. Like there is no formula yeah. and we're going to figure it out together, but like just going through and being very others focused and not me focused, um, which is not how a lot of people are raised to think, you know, it's very much like a, what are you going to do? What's your career? which are, are very good and important things, but it's really important to be, my husband has always been so amazingly focused on other people. He grew up with um, three special needs brothers. Oh. And I think that had a lot to do with it because he's just always 
seen, and that was in the nineties, right? So like super yeah. intolerant, like not today's culture at all. No. And so he remembers times like eating out at a restaurant, people coming up and openly making fun of them or why did you keep having kids? That's so irresponsible of you, you know, just yeah. stupid stuff like that. Very hateful. And so he's always done, and he grew up doing like special Olympics and just like being really involved in that world. And so we just try to raise our kids to just be very like other centered and just, um, how does that make the other person feel? How that make you feel? You know, like we're in that yeah. like kind of toddler little kid. So it's very elementary conversations. Um, and then our daughter, she, she's so sweet. She's like a gentle giant. So like, it's really hard to teach her like, okay, don't use is like, she literally is huge. So it's like, okay, don't use she? your height. She's five, but okay. she's like the size of like a seven year old. Um, my, daughter's, my daughter's really, or my husband's really tall. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So she's like huge. Wow. So she's just really, really tall. She's not like a monster child, but she's just very <laughs> tall. And so it's like one of those things where like, I, and she has been ever since she was little. So it was always yeah. like teaching her like, okay, don't use your size, to like intimidate other kids but also don't let them walk over you. Cause then she'll be like, Oh, okay. She'll just let them like push her around and she's very innocent. So it's like, it's really hard to walk that line. But again, the more you parent, the more you realize like, wow, all these lessons are lessons I need to learn myself. Like, yes. you know, how do you stand up for yourself, but also not be a pushover, like not be pushover, but also be about four other people. Yeah. And like, and that's a really, yeah. yeah. Like that's a hard concept for adults to learn, let alone trying to break that down for a five-year-old. Well, and um, I think in yeah. parenting, you know, you give, you give each other and you're teaching your kids too, that other people make mistakes, mommy and daddy make mistakes and there's grace for both. So oh, absolutely. I think that's so important for our kids to see that we're not perfect and that we do mess up because I know people who saw perfect parents and then really struggled in their own marriage because they thought their parents were perfect. And if they were perfect, then they could do it too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have, now I knew my parents weren't perfect. I knew my grandparents weren't perfect. I just, I, and my husband is the same way, but I don't want my kids to think we're something we're not like, I'm totally fine being a screw up some days and apologizing to my kids when I mess up, you know? And I don't think that was something when I was younger as a kid that, that people really talked about is that parents also make mistakes. And parents can also apologize for when they do make those mistakes because then you're teaching your kids grace. Yep. Absolutely. You know what I mean? you know, we've, yeah. And it's, we've had those conversations with our daughter very much like, Hey, I screwed up and everyone makes mistakes. And I'm, and I've apologized to her or said, you know, mommy did this because it was a mistake. And, and we've had those conversations about you obey mom and later you obey God and mom still has to obey God, you know, like how that cycle works and just, but basically like we're all adults and someday you're going to be adult and you're a kid right now. And so this is what it looks like, but we're all just people, even though we're in different roles right now type of thing. And just like, yeah, the same things that you're going through, like you apologize and guess what? Mom and dad have to apologize and mom yeah. and dad argue and we make mistakes and then we apologize. And I love that our kids get to see us do that because that's more real. And they've definitely seen us have disagreements, apologize to each other, apologize to them, um, admit that you're so, you know, just, I'm sorry. And just see that because yeah, kids learn so much by example yeah. and living that out and living out that others, but you know, mentality as well, just kind of thing, you know, it's like one thing to lecture her all the time, you know, or something about like do that in the playground. But if Matt and I aren't living that out ourselves, then that's really hypocritical. So it's good to remember to like live that out as well. For sure. Absolutely. What's a, what's a book or a song or movie or advice that you were, you were given, whether you followed it or not, that changed or shaped your life? I think books have probably been the most influential. Um, but I think some of the best ones have come like more recently kind of thing. So I don't remember mm -hmm. one from like, Oh, when I was younger, you know, like this book changed everything, but it's just, Oh man, like there's so many wonderful, unfortunately there's a lot of terrible books out there too, but there's some really wonderful books, um, that have just been amazing. Uh, that there's this one, there's been a couple like the, I'm trying to think Jesus of suburbia. I think one is hmm. called, that one's a really good one. Jesus of suburbia. That one's really good. And then, um, radical by David Platt. Read that. Amazing. That was good. Compassion revolution is really good. Um, obviously anything by Bob Goff. Amazing. Um, know, but just books him. like, 
this book's kind of like that. Um, since yeah, you guys were in, um, in San Diego, were you involved with Francis Chan's church way back when, or, or no, anything? we weren't, but I love his, you and me forever by Francis. Yes. Chan. Oh, that was a good yeah. one. Nice. And it took me like over a month to finish. Cause I kept getting like called out on it. And I was like, I don't want to read this right now. <laughs> it was really hard for me to read through. Cause I felt like I was getting like, it's just really a good reminder as to like what Jesus commissioned it. Like what is our end goal in life? And like our end goal is not like, Oh look, my family's really great. Like that's yeah. not what it's about. And just remembering like, that's one of the reasons why we wanted foster kids in our family, you know, like why we wanted to adopt was to like, dude, like God is coming and people do need to hear about him and, you know, grow up in how, like just have the opportunity to hear about him. And that's one way that we could, um, tell people, you know, like just, you know, witness his love, live that out kind of thing for people in that parental role. Um, so yeah, but that book was like, I feel like it's really easy for me to become super lazy and like oh, yeah. just kind of fall into like, right. Like it's, that's normal humanity, but like, you know, you just kind of fall into like, oh, I'm really tired because I have four kids, but you know what? Like I did my part. Like that's my, my purpose is in being a mom. And it was really called me out and being like, that's actually not your whole, that's not the whole story. Yeah. Like that's yeah. part of it, but you have more work to do. Get up off your butt and like, keep going. Yeah. So yeah, I actually thought that book was like, I don't for me, it was very challenging as far as like, wait, this is uncomfortable because I'm not doing everything perfectly. Well, and that's um, why I love him is because he, he's like, he could totally call you out. You know what I mean? Right. Um, he's been at world mandate the last few years. It's a conference down here in Texas and it's out of Waco. And he told them, listen, I'm not going to come. I made a commitment this year. I'm only going to come and speak to people that are on the level, like real Christians. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to come and speak your fluff, you know, just to entertain you or whatever. Yes. So, Which I love like, Oh my goodness. What is a I feel like maybe, okay, maybe edit this out later, dude, because maybe I shouldn't say this, but like, I feel like so many times, like these wonderful Christian authors and people, like they get into like the public spotlight and it just becomes like the same crap God talks about. Yes. Of like, dude, your conferences, your conventions, like I'm sick of it. When's the last yeah. time you actually talk to me? You know, just like, I, I don't know. It's really disappointing. Sometimes I feel like we're just, but again, like we're all broken, you know, like we, we all make mistakes and it's really tempting. It must be really tempting. Like when you're in that spotlight to like fall away from the truth, but I just have the yeah. utmost respect for him for like staying truth to like, Nope, this is what we're instructed to do. Like, this is what's actually real. This is what matters. And it's not about my acclaim or anything to do with my pride. Yeah, exactly. I, I was just, I interviewed, um, Liz Griffin. She's a, she's part of Antioch too. Um, but she's out of Austin and <laughs> we kind of both went into a tirade about the whole like the fluff or whatever like just tell yes. you like, what you want to hear your americanized you know christianity which is right crap, by the way so <laughs> comfortable like oh you know yeah pour yourself a glass of wine you're doing fine like whatever <laughs> let's all complain about being victims and it's okay it's like where where did the bible say like i missed that part <laughs> Well, and I remember, um, I grew up in the nineties and so like in churches, they used to talk about the things that you do here are what help build your mansion in heaven. And I'm like, <laughs> I have literally read the Bible from cover to cover at least three times now. Nowhere <laughs> does it talk about my good works, building my big mansion. But that, right. doesn't that sound like some American BS? Like, oh, it totally right, does. You, yeah. Like, <laughs> you live in a small house now, but keep feeding the poor and you'll live in a great big Nick mansion in heaven. Please. Do you or think that? Oh my goodness. Same with like when people are like, oh, like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church, but you know, like all paths lead to God, you know, this kind of stuff. I'm like, okay, hold up. Like if you actually read the Bible, like Christianity is one of the most loving, inclusive, everyone is welcome, but also incredibly intolerant. Like there is no flexibility here. Like this is not like a, oh yeah, it's cool if there's other gods involved. Like I'm pretty, a lot of the Old Testament had a lot of death going on because of stuff like that. Like, yes. yeah. are, have you actually cracked open this book? Like, do you actually know what Jesus and God said? Cause they didn't actually say any of that, but like all these things just, they sound very nice. Like we have yeah. this very vanilla toned down PC bland version of Christianity. And I really wonder like how many people have actually opened this book? Like it's challenging. And then the more I read it, the less I know, but you know it to be true. Like it's, you know, it's yeah. just this really weird 
And yeah, anyway, it's just, the it's, more you read, like if you've read Romans, I don't, I probably 16 times now since I was younger or whatever, but each time I read it, I'm more confused than I was before. Like first right. I think I know what Romans is about. And then I read it and I'm like, Son of a mother, I don't know what any of this is about again. You end up having more questions than answers. And there's like, there's times that I have read through the Bible and I put a little question mark next to something like, it's like you're, you know, what the hell moment. And you're like, I don't understand what this means. Yeah. And you go back each year, like hoping to find the, an and it's still there, but it's like one of those, okay, I'm never going to figure out what that actually means. I'll just, that's one of those I'm going to put to the side. Yes. Like, that's why. So question. I listened to, well, I, I try to read, but this year I've just been listening to, cause obviously life kids busy. Yeah. Um, so I listened to the Bible through in one year and it's called Bible in one year. And it's this app, um, by like Nikki Gamble, I think, or Gimble. Yeah. 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 So that's my like go-to every year to get through the Bible in one year. And I love it because he has a commentary on each section and I'm like, sweet, I'm too stupid to understand what this says. Like yeah. someone explain this to me. And I love it because I'm like, Oh, okay. Awesome. Like someone else is like helping me. And there's still questions though. Cause he still doesn't hit on every verse or, you know, I'm still like, wait, hold on. You kind of glossed over that. Like, what does that mean? So I because love, he doesn't know either. Right. <laughs> And look at him, you know, I took one of his courses years ago when we like first started going back to church and, and, um, the whole like premise of this class was like, if you were Christian before you come back, whatever, you know, and the great thing about this guy is he has an English accent. So it was entertaining. It was like, oh yeah. I love his accent. Right. And the person who reads the Bible is like this really Shakespearean accent. It's like, oh, I love it so much. <laughs> Makes the Bible sound way better than when I read it. <laughs> like Charlton Heston reading the Bible to you. That's what he should have done. In his oh my God. They should get who, who now could do that? Morgan Sean Freeman. Connery? There you go. Yes. Morgan Freeman. <laughs> that guy gets more voiceover work than... <laughs> Who knows? I think he's, but I mean, he's always God anyway. So it would, people might take it really seriously if he was actually reading the Bible. Oh, I saw a preview for an interview with God. I think it's the movie interview with God or whatever, but the okay. guy that was playing God, I was like, I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Cause he's not Morgan Freeman. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. What is something that you would tell the teen or 20 year old version of yourself? Um, whatever that, that age was for you, that this girl is out there struggling through her story right now, just where we're, where you were, what would you tell her? When I was 20, I had like all these wonderful intentions and I just wanted God so passionately. And I like was almost about to make a lot of bad decisions, <laughs> even though I really, and I really just wanted God more than those bad decisions. Um, and the wonderful thing was, is that I sought out people who knew God and were just had wonderful hearts who could pour wisdom into me, who I could ask questions, who I could be vulnerable and honest with. And they gave me the words of encouragement, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy to continue to pursue God. So if I were giving advice, I would say just like seek out those people who love Jesus and love and know you, you know, um, and aren't interested in the baggage and the drama and the stories, but just interested in really in you living life, you know, like who have like that heart of Jesus, heart of teachers, um, those people are going to be invaluable and good, great resources to go to um, and just ask and be open and seek and be open with God to you. I feel like so many times we tell everyone else our problems and then I'm like, oh, did I actually talk to God about that or ask yeah. his advice or opinion? And so just, tell, you know, tell God, confess and God, like just tell him like I am struggling with this or I want to know this or I don't know what to do here, but I want you more than this. And like he, and from my experience, he has never, ever failed to come through and deliver above and beyond what I deserve or even knew to ask for in those situations. That's what I would say. Almost like you're looking for somebody who's doing life better than you and is ahead of you. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. We need those role models in our life for sure. Yeah. At every stage. I still need them now. I love having yeah. friends who are parenting that next stage ahead of me or 
who have done foster care adoption longer than I have, or now like with us running our own business. Hey, you've run your own business for 10 years. Like, tell me what you would have done differently. What would you do? You know, just, yeah. yeah, like there's so much wisdom to be learned, not just in the scriptures in the Bible, but from the people God has put all around you and they're all around you. Um, and the good ones will very much be on your team and be ready to, you know, fight for you, advocate for you, give you good information. And there's always people like that around. Absolutely. You just have to know where to find them, build yeah. your community. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Bryn, for being on the podcast. I just, I love our conversation. I love when we start conversations like this and you never really know where it's going to go. And it takes all this twists and turns. I love it. It's my favorite. <laughs> It's awesome. you, well, thank you so much for having me on and everything. Absolutely. Can you share with people where to find you, all your social and all that stuff and what you're doing? Yeah. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram. Um, so you can find me under Brynweed in Instagram. And then I do blog occasionally at brokenbutrunning.com. Um, very sporadically, very occasionally. Um, but yeah, you can also find me on there. I actually used to be a writer. And so that's just kind of like a fun release for me to kind of get that writing bug out of my system and stuff and just talk more about our family and our story and kind of what we're going through. Awesome. I love that. I was going to ask, are you writing this stuff down? Because you're going to, you're going to want to remember these moments, even when they come and it's like the, the day from hell where, you know, you haven't showered in like several days and you know, your kids are just like, you're ready to just lock yourself in the closet and cry for like 10 minutes. This yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're going to want to write these things down. And I love that you're a writer too. Um, I just really want to thank you for what you're doing, especially your part in foster care. I think that's so, so important. And I love that. That's a beautiful story that you got to share. Well, yeah, and I'm so glad we got to connect and thanks so much for having me on. Y'all be sure to follow Bryn's journey on Instagram and um, on her blog. I'll give all the information will be down in the show notes for you guys. If you want to catch up with what I'm doing in between episodes, you can find me at wendyjolson.com or on all the social medias at MRS Mrs. Wendy J. Olson, O-L-S-O-N, um, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate your support and I'll see you next week.